Good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, we're taking a bit of a break from our Ecclesiastes and uh, going to be looking at Easter, obviously, for the next uh, couple of weeks, and we'll jump back into Ecclesiastes uh, after Easter. So if you have your Bibles today, uh, why don't you turn to John chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at John chapter 12, uh, verses 12 through uh, 35 uh, this morning. So we're, we're obviously today is, is, is Palm Sunday, and whenever there's um, someone famous, when you look at it, you can see it on the news, see it on TV, wherever, wherever there's someone famous, there tends to be crowds that, that follow. Crowds tend to follow when someone famous is arriving. If, and I'm not saying you like this person or, or, or this couple, but let's just be honest. If Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey showed up in downtown Boyertown and went to the famous grill shop, um, I, I fully believe that the downtown would be packed with, with people, whether you like them or not. Like, like if, a, if a Hollywood star or a, an up-and-coming rising star, a championship team, if a president, maybe not so much now, but uh, something like that, like came into town, maybe, I don't know, I'll just say maybe, like, like I believe a crowd would, would follow and a crowd would stir. Even if The Bachelor himself showed up in Boyertown, and I'm not recommending this show, but some of you like from Hope have special interest in that, and, and if you know, you know, kind of thing. Thing. But, like, we, we love grand entrances. We, we like the whole red carpet events. We like parades. We, we tend to glorify people. Like, like we, we put banners up in arenas. We, we build trophy cases. We have statues in front of arenas in different places. We put stars on walkways. We have the, the hall of fame. We will follow people on, on social media. We do it all the time. Jesus on Palm Sunday, which is known as the triumphal entry, he, he was making an entrance. He was making an entrance into town, and he was drawing a crowd. But, but here's the thing. Like, like when you look at this story, you have to understand, and, and I know maybe a lot of us, we've read this over and over and over again. But, but when Jesus was drawing a crowd, for many, this whole event ended up being a bit of a letdown. It ended up being a bit of a letdown because it really wasn't what some of the people were expecting. And we know that because many people, um, maybe not all of them, but at least some of the people that cheered him when he came in on that Palm Sunday, when he made his entrance on Palm Sunday, some of those people were the same that were yelling, crucify him a, a week later. And I think the thing that they miss and the thing that we miss often is this. Jesus was everything that they needed. He was everything that they needed, just not what they wanted. And Jesus Christ, he is like no other king. As Luke chapter 19 verse 10 tells us, he is like no other king who has come to seek and save the lost so, so let's look at the events surrounding uh, his triumphal entry in John chapter 12, uh, starting in verse 12. Let's read 12 to 19 uh, to begin. It says this. It says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him, and he had been done to him, and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So, so just to set the scene, it, it, it's Passover week. So, so many people were already in Jerusalem and making their way there. And, and word of Jesus arriving, 
Word of Jesus coming into town drew an overwhelming crowd. Some would say over a million and a half, closer to two million people were in town at that time. I mean, if that was true in downtown Boyertown, it would be a mess because there's no parking now, let alone millions of people. So it was putting the crowd, you have to picture it, into a frenzy. And many were there, not just for Passover, but many were there just to get a glimpse of Jesus Christ. They had heard or even witnessed his teachings, his miracles. They knew he was someone that was defying the Pharisees. They knew rulers wanted him arrested. I mean, this guy was like Hollywood material with all the controversy. And so people wanted to see him. And the recent raising of Lazarus from, from the dead, I mean, that just put the crowd over the top. And there were people that saw that and saw Jesus walking with him. And people were still witnessing and talking about this. So, so this kind of superstar status, he kind of gets this superstar status that he never asked for. And, and the story says, as he approached the crowds grew and the crowds gathered and palm branches were being waved and people placed their cloaks on the ground which made like a, a red carpet entrance for him as he made his way towards Jerusalem. Shouts of Hosanna, save us, rang out from, from, from the crowd as they're quoting Psalms 118. To them, Jesus, to some in that crowd, he was their deliverer. Like they're looking at Jesus as the one who would eventually issue what would basically be like a military call to squash Roman oppression. So in their minds, they're picturing like this young, handsome, prestigious king that's going to ride in, ride in on, on a stallion with sword in hand. Sword in hand, basically declaring war, bringing victory and freedom. And the thing is this, Jesus is the victorious king, but not in the way that they were expecting. They wanted and they were hoping for a, a political or a military savior. That's what they were looking at. And, and here's the thing, we, we fall into that same trap, don't we? Like, like, we can do the same thing. We can put all of our hope and all of our, cover, our, our confidence in, into a political candidate. And, and we can even put in the government. We, we kind of put all our hope. If we can just get this candidate in, then, then, then he's going to fix all that's broken, everything that's been destroyed and turned upside down. He's going to make it great again. He's going to turn it around. He's going to be the one to bring change. And I'm not saying, like, you need to be wise in how you vote, and you need to take it seriously, and you need to clearly, biblically think through how you vote. But don't put your full hope and confidence in a political party or figure. Don't put it in the government. Don't put it in, in, in earthly kings, you could say. We are to put our full hope and confidence in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is like no other king. He has come to seek and save the lost. And Jesus didn't come riding on the stallion with, with sword waving. He came on a donkey, a symbol of humility and peace, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. So this put the crowd into a bit of a stir and a bit of confusion. And they all had different perspectives as they're watching this take place. The disciples themselves, which always amazes me, they're, they're confused. The disciples were confused. Some people there are just kind of fans, wanting to see the glimpse. Maybe they want an autograph. They want to see what's going on. They want to see what's going to happen next. The Pharisees there are watching all the commotion, and they realize all eyes are locked on Jesus Christ. It's almost like it doesn't matter what they do in that moment because all eyes are locked on Jesus. And Jesus knew his time had come. What he had been born to do, that time has come. And the Gentiles and the Jews and the crowds, they're, they're seeking answers. They're ready and they're listening. But his next words probably made some people want to just throw their hands up in disgust. 
throw their hands up in, in disgust. Like, like this whole thing, what they were waiting to see was, was this, just a big letdown. Look at what he says in verses 20 to 26. It says this. It says, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. At that point, they're probably like, yeah. And then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Anyone who serves me, the Father will honor. So, again, they're probably awaiting like, like some kind of announcement of his campaign and all the strategic details of how he's going to do what he's going to do and how he's going to overthrow Roman oppression and how he's going to set up his new way of government to make everyone better and everything better. And they're waiting for this. And yet he tells his disciples and he tells those listening in from the crowd, he says, here's how it's going down. In a way, it's like to the disciples, it's like I've already told you this. I've already told you this. You're not getting it, but here's how it's going to go down. I will fulfill my mission, and I will set up my kingdom by dying. I will do it by dying. He, he, he says, when, think about it. When a seed is planted, when a seed is planted, when it goes into the ground, it literally dies. And when it dies, it's able to birth new seed, bringing forth abundant life. He's saying, that's exactly what I will do. I will be crucified and I will die, bringing life to all who believe in me. And he says, if you want to live, if you want to live, if you want to follow me, if you want eternal life, then you also need to die. He's basically saying, you need to die to yourself. You need to die to selfish ambition. You need to die to the ways of this world. You need to die to sin. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, or, or verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, Paul says, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. And then Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you want to live, you must die. And Jesus is saying, by dying, by dying, Jesus becomes our Savior. You realize, right, there is no Christianity without the cross of Jesus Christ. Christianity does not exist without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Salvation does not depend on what you do. It depends solely on the atoning death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. To refuse the cross, to refuse the cross is to refuse the only way to eternal life. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus speaking. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. I heard a, a pastor say that, uh, you, you know, we often settle in, in America. 
Like, like we, awful, we often settle in America because it, as Americans, we kind of have this mindset, and especially the older you get, maybe as you hit that midlife and you're kind of looking a little more towards a, the, the future, we kind of have this mindset that, that our great reward is retirement. Like, like that's what Americans live for, especially as you get older. You know, I'm not saying you think about that when you're younger. But once you kind of have a, a family and kids are getting old and you're working, you're like you're looking at, we, we live like, like our great reward in this life is retirement. So if I work hard and I, I live a certain way and I save enough money and you watch what we do, we do everything to set ourselves up for retirement. Which here's the reality, like we can maybe work hard and we can maybe save enough and maybe, and I'm using the word maybe, maybe you get, depending on how good your job was or how smart you were or, or how kind of things fall, maybe you, you get 5, 10, 15 years of, of retirement, maybe. But, but the thing is this, if that's what you live for, your, your bar is set way too low. If that's what you live for, your bar is set way too low because you know it's not even guaranteed you get to enjoy any of that. I'm not saying you, you, don't, you don't do things to be wise and, and invest and all that stuff. I'm just saying there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee where your health is. There's no guarantee where your family stability is. There's no guarantee your job, your life. There's no guarantee whatsoever. And yet we live for that. And we put everything into that. And yet what scripture tells us is the greatest reward is not here on earth, but experiencing the glories of eternity with your Savior. Dying to self, living for Jesus, guarantees the greatest reward one could ever imagine. And Jesus was born to die to give us life. But here's the thing. That's all true, and yet Jesus, we see his humanity here in verses 27 to 35. The thought of the cross still made him tremble. He knew that was his mission, and that's where he was going, but it still made him tremble. Look at verses 27 to 35 of chapter 12. He says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him. We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. Jesus is trembling. He's trembling at the thought of the cross. Because here's the thing, like, like yeah, there's going to be agony and there's going to be brutal beating and there's going to be pain and there's going to be physical torture and there's going to be the beating and he's going to die in one of the worst ways known to man through the crucifixion. And, and yet the thing is this, he shook at the core, he shook at the thought of the cross and he shook at the core because the cross meant separation from the Father. The cross meant separation from the Father because soon the one who was sinless would, wear, would bear the weight and the horrors of the world's sin. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mark chapter 14, 34, it says, it says he said to them, Jesus speaking, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. 
remain here and watch. God's full wrath, he had perfect unity with the Father. And yet God's full wrath was about to be placed against him due to sin. And it made him tremble to think of that, the horrors, the weight of that sin, the separation from the Father. And yet he's still in the trembling. He still declares, I will not back down. This is the purpose of my incarnation. This is why I came and left the glories of heaven and came to this earth. This is why I came in human flesh. And it's all for the glory of God's name. All for the glory of God's name. It says there was a voice that sounded like thunder that was understood by, by Jesus alone. And it was heard among the crowd. And he explains it to him. He's saying, that voice is for you. In a way, there's a warning and an invitation. It was warning and an invitation to them. And it's a warning and an invitation to, to you and I. He, he explains, he says, judgment on this world, judgment on sin, judgment on Satan is here. The cross is my destiny. And there I will bear and judge the sins of the world. But he says, all who look to me will be saved. He's simply saying that the message is clear. Don't be confused. I am the light of the world and you have a choice before you. You, every single person has a choice. You can walk in the light or you can walk in the darkness. You can walk in light or you can walk in darkness. So he invites them. Believe in the light so you can become adopted heirs of the one true king. John 6, No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It's at the cross where, where God, where Jesus draws people to himself. It's why this church, we try every single Sunday in everything that we do, we will always preach Jesus Christ crucified. It has to be central to every message and everything that we do. It's why we preach the supremacy of Christ I was at a conference a few weeks ago, and John Piper, uh, he's a pastor or a retired pastor, he, he says this. He says, listen, the church is not about, it's not about preaching anything but the supremacy of Christ. It's not about Trump supremacy. It's not about American supremacy. It's not about Democratic supremacy or, or, or Republican supremacy. It's all about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. As Colossians chapter 1, or all of Colossians tells us, really, as Colossians tells us we need to be the church so all people see the supremacy of Jesus Christ in all things, over all things, above all things, in everything in this universe. We must preach the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is everything that we need. And yet, sadly for a lot of people, it's just not what they want. And church, don't miss it. That's still the case today. Jesus Christ is like no other king, no other earthly king, no other political figure. He has come to seek and save the lost. The question is, do you believe this? Do you believe this today? Because just as we close, today is the day of grace. Today, he declares, all who look to him and believe will be saved. Do you believe Jesus died so you can have life? He is our hope in this life and beyond. And he invites you, church. He invites you out of the darkness of sin and to live in the light of his care forever in eternity with him. And that is absolutely the greatest reward any single person could ever live for. Let's close it in a word of prayer as the worship team comes up to close the service this morning. Father God, I do pray that we would know you, know you beyond just fans and know you beyond just curiosity, but we are people that we fully believe in who you are and the necessity of, of your death and your resurrection. And, and God, that was, is what you were born to do, that you came into this world to seek and save the lost, and God, that you came to go to that cross to complete that mission, to die for, for our sins and take uh, the punishment that we deserve. So God, that we can have that great reward uh, of eternal life. 
So God, I pray that we would see you as worthy of our full life's devotion and worthy of our full life's praise. And and not just a, a thought here and there, but we would literally deny ourselves and die to self and die to all selfish ambitions and live for your glory alone. Knowing that by doing so, God, that great reward awaits us one day with eternity uh, with you in heaven. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.